Morning everyone, today we're moving on to section 4.4 .4 of the bonding topic and that section is all about intermolecular forces. These are forces between molecules, not covalent bonds. Okay, they're weak forces, typically a tenth, a hundredth of the strength of a covalent bond. Now there are three types you need to know. They are London dispersion forces, sometimes just called London forces, permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions, and last of all, the strongest but still a really weak force between molecules, hydrogen bonding. We're going to look at how all three arise and the consequences of all three. So we'll look at each one in turn, starting with the weakest of the three. Now, London dispersion forces are also known as temporary dipole induced dipole attractions, and you'll understand why that is in a little while. Now, in a lot of A level books, they are referred to as Van der Waals forces, but that's not quite accurate, as you'll see a little bit later. We'll cover what Van der Waals forces are very quickly on a later slide. Now, London dispersion forces are found between every single molecule. Without London dispersion forces, we wouldn't be able to liquefy noble gases. And they're about 1% of the strength of a covalent bond. So typically three to four kilojoules per mole. Now they arise due to fluctuations of electron clouds. And now I want you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine that you are in the lab that we use and there are 10 of you running round one of the tables. Okay, 10 happens to be the number of electrons in a neon atom. So you're all being electrons. Now, overall, that 10 is likely to be split five at one end of the table and five at the other. But as you're all running round, by the way, you don't have to spin on your own axis. Uh, you would just fall over then, probably. But at any instant, there may be seven at one end and three at the other. And if there are seven electrons at one end of that bench, that bench is going to have a small negative charge, delta minus. And the other end will have a small positive charge. Now you then run again, and oh, it's the other way round. There's four at one end and six at the other. So the four will be delta plus, the six will be delta minus, and so on and so on and so on. And you keep doing that. And although the average will end up at five and five, so no overall charge, at any instant, there could be a delta plus at one end of the molecule, one end of the table, and a delta minus at the other end of the table. That is a temporary dipole. It comes and goes as you keep moving around the table. Now, but that temporary dipole then induces the opposite dipole in a neighboring molecule. So if we've got a delta plus at the left-hand side of the table you're all, all running round, the molecule we're focusing on, then the left-hand side of a neighboring molecule will have the opposite charge. And that is called an induced dipole. So, here's a little illustration to try and help. Now, if you do art, oh dear, that's nobody, then when you're doing the shading on this, you need to really make sure that you get it in the right ballpark. Left-hand side is LHS, just in this little abbreviation here. And you can see there, look at my beautiful shading. There's delta plus on one side, but where there's more electron density, the heavier color, it's delta minus. And that is called a temporary dipole. So adjacent molecules will have the opposite dipole because of repulsion. So there is the sort of setup you will get. An induced dipole on a neighboring molecule. There's my original molecule with its temporary dipole and the neighboring molecule has the opposite dipole. 
Now these forces are referred to as being switched on and off because they're there for such a short time because the electron density is continually moving. That is why these forces are so weak. Okay, obviously you can't write as quickly as I'm talking, so what you need to do is regularly pause this video, just in case you hadn't twigged that yet, to catch up with bits and pieces of writing. Well, what consequences do these London dispersion forces have? Well, nothing particularly exciting, I'm afraid. I've already mentioned one. Without them, we wouldn't be able to liquefy noble gases because there'd be no forces of attraction between the noble gases. But when you talk about the increase in boiling point, excuse me, down group seven um, with Miss Curley and periodicity, that's because of the, an increase in London dispersion forces. As the number of electrons gets bigger, so does the size of the London dispersion molecules, and so therefore does the boiling point. The other one, uh, those who did GCSE will know a little bit about the boiling point of alkanes and how it changes with MR, but basically the bigger the alkane, the uh, larger the boiling point, and that again is linked to the size of the molecule and the size of the London dispersion forces. But we will talk more about that when we get on to topic 10. So here we are, permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions, or just dipole, dipole attractions. These occur between molecules with dipoles in them. Okay, a delta plus and a delta minus. And you can see here that it's a weak electrostatic attraction between a delta minus and a delta plus, or delta plus and delta minus if you prefer. It doesn't matter which way around. These are stronger than the London dispersion forces simply because they are there all the time, but they're not as strong as hydrogen bonding. Now, every polar molecule has these dipole-dipole attractions. Now, in addition, they also have van der Waals forces, not van der Waals forces, London dispersion forces uh, between the molecules, because London dispersion forces are found within any molecule, or between any molecule, anyway. Now, van der Waals forces covers a multitude of scenes, if you like. Uh, London dispersion forces are classed as van der Waals forces. Dipole-dipole attractions are actually van der Waals forces. And this one takes just a little bit of thinking about. But if I've got a mixture of HCl, which will have a permanent dipole, and chlorine, the dipole in the HCl will induce dipoles in the chlorine. And so you will get attractions between the HCl and the polarized chlorine. Okay, finally, the strongest of them all, hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is found between molecules that contain a hydrogen atom. Well, you'd have never guessed that. But that hydrogen atom must be attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. These are the three atoms with the biggest electronegativities. So must be attached to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. Now it's the strongest, but it's still only about a tenth of the strength of a covalent bond. And it's a special sort of dipole-dipole attraction. Now it's not quite the same as a dipole-dipole attraction because the hydrogen has a very, in these cases that I mentioned, attached to a nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine, has a particularly strong delta plus charge. It's because of the electronegativity of the nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine, really strongly pulling that pair of electrons in the covalent bond towards themselves. Now, the attraction is not between the delta plus and the delta minus on these, but the attraction is actually between the delta plus and the lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. 
Okay, there is uh, a picture stolen from the internet, not a particularly good one, I'm sorry to say. So, in water, here is my hydrogen bond. And you'll see it's shown as between the lone pair of electrons on an oxygen atom and this hydrogen. We should all know that there's a delta plus there and a delta minus on the oxygen, of course. Then this builds up in 3D because, of course, you'll see that there are two lone pairs, so the possibility of more hydrogen bonds formed. Interesting thing to note is that the angle between the two atoms, the bond angle, if you like, the hydrogen bond angle, is always 180 degrees. Okay, so there's always a straight line between that oxygen and the oxygen on the far side of the hydrogen, the two electronegative atoms. That doesn't matter whether it's in water, ammonia, hydrogen fluoride, or more complicated molecules, that is always the case. Where else do we find hydrogen bonding? Well, I've just given one or two of them away. Hydrogen fluoride, ammonia, Ethanol also contains hydrogen bonding, otherwise it wouldn't be a liquid. And the same with vinegar, ethanoic acid, that contains hydrogen bonding, otherwise that wouldn't be a liquid. These are all very small molecules and they have much higher boiling points than you would expect, therefore. Now, the consequences of hydrogen bonding. There are lots of interesting consequences of hydrogen bonding, um, but we don't need to know any of them for chemistry. But for those biologists amongst you, surface tension would not occur in water without hydrogen bonding. OK, if you're one of these little pond skaters floating across this or skating across the surface of the water without hydrogen bonding, surface tension wouldn't be there to hold you up. And um, when I was young, you used to go and do nasty things to pond skaters. You'd take a little bit of washing up liquid, put, so, put it where the spawn, pond skaters were. That would break the surface tension in the water and these poor pond skaters would, would drown. The, the horrible things little boys used to do. Also, our DNA strands are held together by hydrogen bonding. By the way, do you know how DNA got its name? It's nothing to do with deoxyribose nucleic acid at all, obviously. Uh, people, the people who invented it, Mrs. or discovered it, Messrs. Crick and Watson, were so impressed by their discovery when they sort of unveiled it to everybody else, they couldn't resist going da da. Okay, that's a terrible joke, even for a Monday morning. Um, ice floats on water, as I'm sure you're aware. That's because of hydrogen bonding. And without that hydrogen bonding, if you were a fish in a goldfish pond, every time the water froze, you would end up on the surface of the water. But the fact that water in the form of ice floats on liquid water means that as a goldfish, you are protected, unless, of course, the whole pond freezes. There are lots of other fascinating consequences, but we need to know what's the trend in boiling points of the hydrides of groups four, five, six, and seven. How dull is that? So the hydrides of groups 4, 5, 6 and 7 are these, H2O, H2S and so on. OK, obviously group 5 will contain nitrogen, NH3, PH3 and so on. And group 4, methane, CH4 and so on, SiH4. So now, please don't bother to do this unless you really want to. Um, it comes up on the next slide anyway. But if you plot a graph of period number against boiling point for each of those groups on one set of axes, then you should, in theory, but for the existence of hydrogen bonding, get a general increase down each group as the molecule gets bigger. 
So let's have a look at the plot though. 